say amen? It's been a long time since before today I've heard that song. But uh, how many of you can sympathize with the words of that song? How many of you have, uh, uh, this week even, not just in your lives, but this week even, called out for God to pour his fount of blessings out upon you, for you to recognize the fount of blessing that has been poured out on you? Because that's what it is, Amen. You know, when we get into the um, struggles in our life, we tend to forget that we are drowning, not drowning, but we are neck deep in the fountain of blessings that God has poured out on our life. It's time to wake up and realize that you are blessed. Someone testify that. Say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Man, we are walking through the journey of Paul. The title is The Long and Winding Road. And this week we take a bit of detour out of Paul's life, but it's still connected to what's going on. Last week we started the series uh, with the sermon entitled, It Begins with Murder. You have Paul, the writer of the gospel. Okay. From Paul, we have all of our understanding of salvation, sanctification, justification, theology, grace of God, um, all these things, these, these beautiful freedoms we have in the Bible, we get an understanding of them from Paul's writings. Paul is probably, after Jesus Christ, the most influential Christian to ever live. And yet his story didn't start with Paul the evangelist, it started with Saul the murderer. Most of you know the story, Saul starts out um, giving his approval to the murder of Stephen. And then he goes out and starts beating up on the church. And along that journey, Jesus Christ comes, steps in his way, he sees the light, literally, and he's changed and becomes the great Paul. But there was that period, that period there where he was breathing out, the Bible says, murderous threats against the church. Now, let me ask you something. Do I have any members of the church in this house today? If I do, let me hear you say amen. Okay, I got a couple of you. Have you ever felt threats being breathed out against you for no other reason than that you were a Christian? That you had accepted Jesus Christ? If you haven't, just wait. Okay? Seventh-day Adventists have had a bit of a head start on this. Not to say that we are greater or better than anybody else. But, you know, many of us have experienced have struggles over jobs and over other things because of, of our conviction of holding the Sabbath. And we've had people, you know, uh, say, well, you're going to lose a job. Family members get upset with us for not showing up at parties or something, you know, because, you know, we were trying to honor God's law. Early Christian church is doing this. They're doing everything right. They're growing by leaps and bounds. And yet, in the midst of this, persecution comes upon them. And today I want to talk a little bit about that time of persecution. It's called, uh, today's sermon is entitled, Scatterbrained. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that your spirit would speak to us in this moment. That wherever we've come from, whatever we've been dealing with today, that your spirit will move the obstacles and let us see you and know that you are with us. Through this message, let us know you deeper, Lord. I ask that you would once again shut my mouth and let only your voice be heard. This is my prayer. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's an old one. Maybe you remember it. I don't know. But an elderly couple got married. And... Um, it was sweet. The whole church shows up. It's a rural town uh, back in the 1800s. And he shows up with his um, donkey cart. And she has her donkey. And they tie the donkey cart to the donkey. And he takes all of her belongings and moves it out of her place. Because they're going to start the rest of their lives together. 80-something-year-old lives together. Uh, 
at his home. And so they pull their belongings in the cart, and they're taking the road now to, um, to, to his house. And as they're walking along, her donkey stops. And he's all, oh, come on now, Clyde. Come on now, Clyde, let's go. And the donkey won't move. And so she <clears throat> clears her throat, and she's all, Clyde, that's one. And the donkey starts walking again. Click, 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 click. Well, a couple miles down the road, the donkey stops. He's like, come on, Clyde. Let's go, Clyde. He's like, what's wrong with your donkey? She's like, it's okay. It's okay. Clyde, well, that's two. And the donkey starts walking. Click, 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 click. About two miles from their home, the donkey stops. And he's begging and pleading, Clyde, come on, let's go, Clyde. We're almost there. Let's just go. And she's all, Clyde, I told you. That's three, to which she pulls out a shotgun, and bam, the donkey falls over. The man is terrified. He's all, what do you do? Are you out of your mind? Have I married a crazy person? What kind of person does that? And she turns to him and says, honey, that's one. <laughs> See, sometimes to get us moving in the right direction, God needs to get our attention. Can I get an amen from some donkeys out there? Okay. Any other donkeys out there like your pastor who sometimes God needs to look down and say, Tim, that's one. Let's get back on on the right road. You see, the Christian church had gotten themselves into that situation. They had become incredibly popular. They had uh, gone forth and started spreading the word of God, first the 12, then the uh, 150, and then the 3,000, and then 5,000. And the Bible says the whole city came out and everyone was converted. Well, almost everyone. They were experiencing a level of success the church has not yet seen since. Living together, sharing everything, loving on each other. It was a time of great uh, joy in the church and great comfort in the church. And because of their great comfort, they got stagnant. Got stagnant. And so God had to send something to wake them up. Paul's persecuting the church so violently that it gets scattered. Philip sees Stephen die for sharing Jesus. He is attacked by the enemy so voraciously he has to leave everything and run. But in doing so, the first thing he does is share Jesus. Let's read that story now. It's found in Acts, the 8th chapter. And we're going to be starting with the first verse. On that day, it's the death of Stephen. A great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. Where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That's where the major church was. That's where everybody got confident or uh, complacent. Great persecution broke out the church of Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered. Somebody say scattered. Scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men came and buried Stephen, mourning deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. He's putting people in prison for worshiping Jesus Christ. For holding to their convictions. Do I have anybody here today who has been persecuted lately for holding to your convictions? Those who have been scattered, though, and this should be underlined in your word, those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Someone say hallelujah. So you can't keep the gospel down. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip, and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. When shrieks and evil spirits came out of many, then many paralytics and cripples were healed, and so there was great joy. Not just good joy, not mediocre joy, but great joy in that city. Three things from this that I want to speak to anybody 
who feels like the enemy has been getting the upper hand lately in your life. To anyone who, like Philip, has looked around and seen things being taken from you. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. The enemy coming in and through various matters attacking you in these areas. Killing the good things in your life. Oppressing you. Stealing your rights. If you feel driven from your foundation and scattered throughout the wind, I've got one word for you. Amen. Three things to do when you get scattered. First is be scatterbrained. Be scatterbrained. Today's title is determined scatterbrained. The second is this. Proclaim your signs and wonders. Or let your signs and wonders be proclaimed is probably a better way to put it. And finally, claim his joy. Claim his joy. The first, you got to be scatterbrained. Turn your Bibles to Acts 1, verse 8. The early Christian church had so much success in Jerusalem, spreading the word. We talked about how the whole city believed in the name of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. With that kind of success came complacency. So God had to scatter them. You see, success that leads to complacency is not success at all. Hear what I'm saying. Success that leads to complacency. When you get some kind of success in your life, and you say, oh, hallelujah, I've done it. I'm done. Woo, finally reached that mountaintop. I don't have to do anything anymore. Any of you who ever opened a business and realized the success of starting your own business, you know the fallacy of that idea, right? Because the minute you get that one success, you realize, oh, we got a whole bunch of things going on. My daughter just went to college. Success! She got into college. Hallelujah! But if she thinks she can go up there and just like eat, you know, Cheetos on her bed and hang out in the room all day, she's going to be in a whole lot of trouble. Because success that breeds complacency is not really success. Because success is meant to grow you and equip you to go. Not stop. God had to deal with his people throughout the Bible when they got too complacent in their success. The Israelites, back in Genesis, got into the land of milk and uh, the land of Egypt, the Goshen, which is right by the Nile River, fed all of their fields and everything like that, never had to worry about the rain, never had to worry about anything. God meant them to go to Egypt for a season just for a season, to help them overcome the famine and to bond them together and to focus on him and them and to be united as a family. So they didn't keep running off to all the other nations and intermarrying and stuff like that. So he kept them together for a bit. But they were only meant to stay there for a season. But it became real successful, real comfortable for them. And 400 years later, God had to send a pharaoh who would persecute them to get them to get up and get ready. Has God ever had to do that with you? Have you ever gotten some spiritual success in your life and said, I'm good, I got it, don't need to do anything else? Maybe some of you are living off the spiritual success of your baptism. They haven't really grown and gone out since then. When that happens, God loves us so much that you know what he does? He lets us get scattered. He lets us get scattered. You see, the early Christian church had stayed in Jerusalem, but God had not told them to stay in Jerusalem. Let's listen to the last recorded words of Jesus Christ found in Acts, the first chapter, the eighth verse. It says, Acts 1, chapter 8, or verse 8. When, but you will receive power. What? Power. Power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, you have accepted the Holy Spirit to come on you. Do I have any Spirit-filled people in this house today? If I do, let me hear you say, Amen. So if you are Holy Spirit-filled, it says, then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, yes, in your home, in the place where you are, and in Judea, in the places around you, and in Samaria. Wait a minute, what do you mean Samaria? You know, Samaria was the place that the Jews hated more than any place in the entire world. 
They absolutely despised Samaria. They saw them as uh, cowards and cheats and betrayers. Hated Samaritans. And the Samaritans felt the same way about the Jews. They would sometimes, the Jews, in their journey to Jerusalem, they had a Samaritan town right between them and Jerusalem. They would spend an extra three days going around the city, then have to go through it and see and deal with the Samaritans. They hated them that much. Most violent thing the apostles ever said was, let's call down fire and burn the Samaritan city down to the ground. Christ was horrified. Because Christ was going to give them power to go to Samaria and to, and not just Samaria, but the Bible ends with that statement saying, and to the ends of the earth. But you can't get to the ends of the earth from your couch. See, in order to get to where God needs you in your life, you got to be willing to get up and go. Jesus had spent his entire ministry showing them, showing them that he intended for them to go out. One of the great miracles that I've come to love so much is the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000. He fed the Jews and he fed the Gentiles in both the same way. He broke the bread, which he later told them, the bread is my body, which is broken for you. And then what did he do with the bread? Anybody remember what he did with the bread? He what? He blessed it. Yes, he blessed it. And then what did he do? He gave it to who? The disciples. He gave it to the disciples. See, they then took the bread that he gave them and went out. Went out and spread it out. You see, the awesome thing about the breaking of Jesus' bread is his broken body was meant to unite his spiritual body. His broken physical body was meant to unite his... His broken physical body was meant to unite his spiritual body, to bring people to him. So that no matter where they were in the world, they could have a home in Jesus Christ. But they had to receive the bread. And the way that they had to receive the bread was by people going out. Brothers and sisters, do you know that there is a community in your life today that needs to know Jesus? They're hungry and desperate. And here's the crazy thing. You will often find that when God scatters you, he doesn't often scatter you to the place where you're going to be most comfortable. Okay, because you already dealt with comfort. He often scatters you to places where you're going to be uncomfortable, to dealing with situations that you not, rather not deal with, to your Samaritans. And I don't know who your Samaritans are. Maybe they're your in-laws. Okay, maybe it's your ex. Maybe it's like, you know, the people who are homeless or just people you don't really like dealing with, like uh, extroverts, you know, I mean, uh, right? Am I right about extroverts? So much energy. Ease up. People are looking at me and say, Pastor, aren't you an extrovert? <laughs> if you only knew. My idea of a um, beautiful day is door locked, blinds closed, in a corner somewhere. Nobody talk to me. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Introverts unite tomorrow. Um, But he might send you, the extrovert, to a room full of introverts. And to an introvert, that's terrifying. He may send you, the introvert, into a room full of extroverts. And I'll tell you, that is hell on earth. But he sent you there for a reason. For a reason. I spent the last uh, two weeks visiting with um, good friends of ours. And uh, my wife and her best friend we were staying at their place. And they then invited, you know, one of their very good friends. And all three of them are not just extroverts, but they're type A extroverts. <laughs> Stop. And it was a week and a half of... <laughs> it's so good to be home. But I say all that to say, even in those situations, God has a purpose for you. He's put you there for a reason. To get you uncomfortable. To get you dealing with people who are not like you. So that they can see the power of Jesus Christ. Because guess what? Extroverts need Jesus too. I know it seems like they think they got everything, but they need Jesus too. 
us introverts don't want to come out, don't want to deal with anybody. We need Jesus too. When you find yourself scattered, say praise God. Here's the crazy thing about the scattering. The crazy thing about the scattering. Wherever they went, they were driven to those places because they had lost everything in Jesus' name. Okay? They get to these places. Be like, oh, why are you here? What happened? You lost your business? You lost your job? What happened? Well, I believed in the name of a man named Jesus who was the son of God who was killed and risen again. Already you can hear people go, okay. And you lost everything. You just had to say, I don't believe in Jesus. And you can keep your home and your job and everything like that. Yeah, I had to say it, but I chose not to. Why would you do that? When they testified to the name of Jesus, people saw people who had lost everything, but still praised the name of God, and they wanted it too. They had to have it spread like wildfire. I remember when I was a kid, I um, went outside, and I, I, you know, people see me, know me now, you know, they just met me in the last, you know, the second half of my life. They think, oh yeah, Pastor Jim is kind of intimidating. He's, he's a little intense, a little grumpy, you know. Um, <laughs> my intern's nodding his head right now. Uh, if you could pray for me, I'm going to be getting a new intern soon, and so um, I need to find one that's a little bit more respectful. Great. But like as a child, I was not like that at all. I was like full of joy and wonderment. And you know, like, like always wanting to please everybody. Oh, dad. I remember one day I picked up what I thought was the most beautiful flower in the world. It was like a cloud on a stem. So just like poof, little cotton ball. I picked it up and I ran over to my dad and said, Daddy, look, it's a cloud. He went, huh? And I went, whew. And he poof. Hey, what are you doing? What? He said, that's a weed. I'm like, no, it's a cloud. That's a weed. That's a cloud. Like, no, it's a weed. And he's looking at all of these wonderful little cotton pieces spread out into the yard. And he very, in his gentle Walt Nelson sort of way, explained to me that each of those little seeds, those little cotton pieces were seeds. And they were carrying a different flower in them. And as they landed in the yard, or weed in them, as they landed in the yard, each of those little pieces would spread, pop up. And, oh, so we can have cotton all over our yards. Oh, it's not cotton. It's a weed. Well, as frustrated as he was with me, I could imagine the devil being that frustrated with the scatterbrained Christians. Has the devil's like, no, I'm just going to make them weeds and useless. And Jesus Christ picked them up and went, Phew. And where the devil had only Jerusalem to worry about, all of a sudden, the entire world is now being populated by the name of Jesus Christ. Where are you being scattered to today? Maybe it's in a lost job or a broken marriage. Wherever you're being scattered to, maybe it's in a struggles, in overcoming. Maybe it's in fear and anxiety. But your scattering is an opportunity to glorify Jesus Christ. I invite you to do so today. Second point, which I basically hit all the second point and the first point, but it's okay. So proclaim your signs and wonders. Peter went, or Peter, Philip went to Samaria, the last place any Jew wanted to be. But he had a passion to introduce Jesus to people, and signs and wonders followed his testimony. Okay, if you follow Philip, and there's some debate in the Bible whether uh, Philip the Apostle was Philip the Evangelist, uh, here's what I know. That whatever dude was Philip, he was always introducing people to Jesus. In fact, one of the last moments of Jesus' time on earth, some Gentiles come into town, they're Greeks, and they say, we've heard about this Jesus, we want to meet this Jesus, and they go to Philip because he's somebody who has a face that they can trust, that they're not going to be turned away. Wherever we find Philip, he's introducing somebody to Jesus. And so when he gets scattered, 
When he loses everything, he says, but one thing I've got that they couldn't take away from me, I've got my testimony. I've got the testimony of how I had everything in the world had to offer, but I was empty. And then I met Jesus, and now I've got nothing the world has to offer, but I still got Jesus. And in the midst of his loss, in the midst of his struggle, in the midst of all the things he was going through, he still knew he had Jesus, and so he proclaimed Jesus. And his life became a walking testimony. We've said before, I'm going to say it again, I'm going to keep saying it until they carry my body off this pulpit and out those doors. Your life is a miracle in Jesus Christ. Stop getting comfortable, complacent with that fact. See, here's the amazing thing. Every time someone accepts Jesus Christ into their life, their life changes. Now, when our life changes, we draw together with other people who have accepted Jesus Christ, and we become a church, and that's beautiful. But the danger of a bunch of people who are always in Jesus Christ is it becomes commonplace. And what is a miracle to others, what was a miracle to us, becomes just every other day thing because we're so used to being around it. It's like if my 12-year-old were to come into today and see people carrying around supercomputers in their pockets that took pictures and sent documents and were more powerful than almost any computer that existed on earth in my teens. And it would carry it around in our pockets. And I'd be like, that's a miracle! And you're like, no, my phone. Can't live without it, my phone. Don't let your Christianity become your smartphone. That thing you just get so comfortable, you forget how amazing it actually is. You're, you're, the, the, the fact that you are a walking miracle in God. Sometimes the reason Jesus will scatter us into people who don't know him is so that we can see the difference in the life in Jesus and the life without Jesus. And more so that they can see. See, when, when Philip got amongst the Samaritans and they were like, what are you doing here? What are you doing to this, th th this place that doesn't want you? You know what Philip did? He introduced them to Jesus. When you find yourself in the last place you want to be, your Samaria, introduce that place to Jesus. That may, place may be those who attack you for holding convictions in Jesus Christ. Show them Jesus. That place may be someone who despises you so long, for so long that they've forgotten why they despise you. They just hate your guts. Show them Jesus. That place may be self-hatred and the shame of your own heart. Never feeling like you're worthy or good enough. I invite you right now, show that place, Jesus. Powerful things happen when you bring Jesus into the picture. Signs and wonders come too. Chains are broken. Do I have any brothers and sisters who've had chains broken in their life after they met Jesus Christ? If I do, let me, yeah, let me hear you say amen. Needs are filled. Anybody in here whose needs got filled once they met Jesus Christ? And lives are changed. Have any life changers in here? When we accept Jesus Christ, we become signs and wonders to the world. So I invite you today, invite you today, whatever place you find yourself in, no matter how uncomfortable it is for you, share Jesus with them. I remember when I um, first started, got my first laptop, it was a PC. Uh, a PC, yeah. It was, uh, I think, Inst In Intel? Intel? Is that they make laptops? I think that was it. You can tell I'm very tech savvy. You know, I was so cool because you know, I, could, I could carry it with me places. It weighed 57 pounds, but you know, at least it was you know, portable, right? Because I'm plugging. I love the thing. 
And I remember one time I went to, uh, my wife had a Mac and I wanted to plug mine in and like, you know, I, I didn't, the cord one it wasn't the same. I was so angry. I said, all the other PCs, no matter what version they have, you can plug the cord and it works. But no, Apple, you can't. And I, from that day, I just started hating Apple products. I hated them. So you know, the, the reason it has a little Apple symbol with a bite in it is because it's the forbidden fruit from Genesis. <laughs> you want to take that? Yeah, you'll be kicked out of the garden. Apple's the worst. I hate And they came up with their, like, their the clever commercials. Hi, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. And it made the PC guy seem so nerdy. And the Mac guy was just like, cool. It was, I didn't buy it. I was like, yeah, you're idiots. I don't care. PC for life. <laughs> but something crazy happened along my way. Every single person I met with a Mac sung its praises. It's like never shuts down on me. I never got many problems. Even when I do have problems, they get fixed like that. I'm like, Psh, drinking the Kool-Aid is stupid. And one day, my PC got a virus. It just started going, and I was like, ah! Working on a, a, a term paper for my, my seminary degree. And I went, man, I said, so, well, you can use mine. I said, it was so much easier. And even though I swore in my heart I would never buy a Mac, because I hated them, because they were the devil, the testimonies, not the commercials, not the shiny little slick casing. It's so stupid. Who got put an electric device in metal? That's just dumb. Anyway, not, none of the things they tried to do to allure people to buy their product worked on me. But testimony, testimony after testimony after testimony. If you go into my home, you will see my Samsung phone, but you'll see my PC, my Mac computer. Because after a while, testimonies got to me, and I overcame. Your testimony sometimes is the only thing that will bring another to Jesus. Now, please hear what I'm saying. I'm not equating Max to Jesus. Just the opposite. Is that clear, Internet? Unless you want to sponsor me, Mac. Uh... But what I am saying is our testimony is powerful. And when nothing else will fail, people will see your lives and the way you proclaim Jesus Christ, and they will want what you have, even though they swore it off completely. Next time you meet someone who's sworn off Jesus, don't tell them about Jesus. Show them Jesus in you. Luke 4.18. This is powerful. This is what Jesus Christ claimed about himself in his first sermon. He opened the scroll to Isaiah and he read this passage and he says, this is me. This is also something he promises for you. This is something he empowers you with. So when you hear these words, know that Jesus is talking about you. He says this, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Do I have anybody here who has the spirit of the Lord on them? Amen. Because he has anointed me, you have been anointed. To what? To preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Brothers and sisters, you are living in God's favor today. And if you realize that, if you know that, it's time for you to get up and go and tell somebody you've got God's favor too. So, but you understand, I'm a sinner. I fall. I break stuff all the time. I'm broken. Uh, and shut up. Accept Jesus and get his favor. Period. Your struggle does not determine your Jesus. Your struggle does not determine how much your Jesus loves you. Your struggle does not determine how powerful you can be in Jesus Christ. The only thing that can keep you from being all that Jesus Christ has called you to be is your choice to stay down. That's it. And for anybody feeling unworthy today, I'm just going to say it one more time. Stop looking at yourself and start looking at him. Because when we accepted Jesus Christ, we died. And he was resurrected in us. 
So you may not be worthy, okay. But guess who is? The Jesus who lives in you. Can I get an amen? amen. Live that Jesus today. And when you do, third point, you will have complete joy. You will be able to claim his joy. Because Philip was willing to be scattered and go into that place, people who didn't know Jesus met Jesus. And their lives are changed. Prisoners were set free. Cripples walked the straight and narrow. And people met Jesus. And because they did, there was great joy there where there had been none before. Is there great joy in your city today? Are the walls of your life painted with praise? Are the streets paved with freedom? Are there skyscrapers of thanksgiving in the city of your hearts today? Well, if not, there can be. There can be. The good news about joy is you don't have to feel joyful to have joy. Like love, joy is a choice offered to us by God. It's not dependent on circumstances or feeling, but on faith that God is with you. her name because I don't want to embarrass her. But there's an auntie who I always worked with. And I loved working with her. Right? She's always so positive. So joyful. That, that, that I sometimes get a little irritated with her. Okay? You know, introvert, extroverts. And I thought like, you know, like, like, like I get down she thought, it's okay, Pastor, you just pray about it. It'll be okay. God will be with you. I said, yeah, thanks, auntie. You know when you're down on yourself and you're frustrated, the last thing you want is someone positive and cheerful telling you, oh, it's going to be okay. Just pray about it. I was like, you don't even know. In my mind, you know, I'm not going to say that. Oh, thank you, auntie. That's what I said. Thank you, auntie. Blessings to you. But my mind goes, you don't even know. He said, you know, he just, yeah. yeah. Some people you think they, they came out of the womb saying, praise God, you know. And like this from the, the very beginning, they were just like, you know, holy and you know, wrapped them in the clothes. And they, you know, thank you, doctor. And you know, just, you know, that, that's what you think. I thought that about auntie. You know, she just, you know, she's always had it be and easy. You know, God's always been blessing her when every step she takes, wildflowers pop out of her feet. And nah. she's talking about her life. But the husbands who had died before their time, those that had cheated on her, the kids who had passed away, the struggles upon struggles upon struggles that she had had. I said, Auntie, how? I said, the pastor talking to her, Auntie, how, how can you always be so happy? So because I have Jesus, Pastor. Because I know that all that stuff is okay. I'm going to see them again. And Jesus, he makes it all worthwhile. I can tell you about the job she had lost and uh, years and years of poverty that she went through. But I resolved in my mind that day. I was not going to let circumstances steal my joy. I had Jesus, and that's all I needed. Tears in my eyes. I got into the car and I said, now on, it's only joy. Lasted until I got to the stop sign. Some guy cut in front of me. And I was like, come on! <laughs> See, I realized joy doesn't have to be about feeling. It's about choice. A choice to have faith in God. To know that he's with you. To know that even though you've lost everything this world could ever offer, you've got heaven waiting for you. You may not have a home here, but you got streets of gold up there. Your body may be falling apart, but that's okay. He's going to give you a new one. And everyone you've lost in Jesus Christ, 
though it is sad now, guess what? I don't grieve like the world grieves because I know this for a fact. One day, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud shout and the voice of the archangel. And those who have claimed Jesus will rise. You're going to see dad again. You're going to see mom again. And we are going to be united with them. And so though this world is going to mess us up, come after us with everything they got. I keep my eyes heaven bound. Because there, there's Jesus. Everything I want. And on this planet, while I'm going through the thick of it, guess where Jesus is? Right here with me. Let me ask you something today. Do you want to choose joy? If you want to choose joy, I invite you right here, right now to say, I've got the joy. I've got the joy. You've said it. Now I invite you to go live it in the name of Jesus Christ. I have just a few announcements and then you can go. First is this, that um, we had scheduled a hike for Makapu this today, but because the rain um, that came through earlier and there's threats of rain later, uh, the person who's going to lead the hike says that they're going to uh, postpone the hike. So uh, check our Facebook, keep alert on our Facebook page so you can be aware of when we're going to have the next one. But this uh, hike has been canceled. Uh, picnic. So uh, they also had scheduled a picnic at Ho'omaluhi for, for people who would like to join them. Uh, this is uh, Jason and Courtney. Uh, if you would like to join them, if you'd like to do a picnic with them today, um, see Jason. Jason, wave your hand so everyone knows who you are. I'm sure everyone knows Jason. Uh, we'll be, uh, so if you'd like to, to brave that, we invite you to go ahead and um, see Jason right after the service, and we'll let you make that decision then. Uh, there is going to be a funeral tomorrow. Uh, one of our founding sons, uh, Wayne Taihook, uh, will be here at the church. Uh, there is going to be a drive-through for that, for anybody who would like to uh, express their condolences to the family. The funeral itself, though, is uh, only for church members. So, uh, or not church members, only for family members. Uh, because of COVID, we have a limited number of people that we can allow on property. And so they're thanking you for your... Um, well wishes and your condolences, but um, the funeral itself is only for family. That will be here tomorrow. Also, uh, if you were planning to do ministry uh, at the church tomorrow, uh, you have to postpone that because of the funeral. Finally, uh, our live streams. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying the live streams we've been having on Facebook uh, all this time. We are going to be transitioning, starting next week, our live streams to YouTube. Now. Well, if you say, but I got on Facebook and I want to see you on Facebook. Well, here's the thing. We're going to be uh, posting the links to the live stream on our Facebook account. So if you're still coming on the Facebook to see us, you just hit the link. It'll take you right to YouTube. YouTube, though, is a little bit more open for everybody. Um, you don't have to be a member of anything to be a part of to, to see the videos. And so it's a little more ex uh, inclusive. So we have, um, thanks to Isaac and uh, Kyler and our new intern, um, my gal, we are so happy to have Miguel, uh, even though he's a little sassy and he might get fired. Uh, but we, uh, we're, we're, we're transitioning over to YouTube. The uh, YouTube account is Kanyoe Seventh-day Adventist Church. Just type that into the YouTube search bar and you'll find us and all the sermons and everything will be on there to join us. Uh, we'll continue meeting here live for as long as they let us. I want to thank you guys for coming today. Uh, oh, last announcement. Just pray for Auntie Rachel Michaela. Uh, I had the pri privilege of anointing her daughter this week, Tuesday, in Castle Hospital um, ICU. Uh, she passed away last night. And so keep Auntie Rachel in prayers. Uh, I was going through a tough time, but she was here at first service, beaming with a giant smile on her face. She had a joy that even death couldn't steal. And I... Um, uh, she's an inspiration, so keep them in your prayers.
Happy Sabbath, everybody. Want you? Oh, hold on. Okay, so if you brought food, sorry. Uh, Jason's postponing on you. You have to eat it by yourself.